So in 2003, the late Rachel Held Evans was chosen by her classmates to give the commencement address at a small Christian college. She prepared for this for weeks amidst final exams and senior parties, even soliciting feedback from her parents and her professors in advance of the address. That day, she told her fellow students, go out and change the world, and she challenged them to speak the truth in love. She said, the world is dark. We are the light. The world is sick. We have the medicine. The world is lost, and we know the way. But over a decade later, she wrote in an article entitled Commencement Address Redo about her wish to go back in time to give a different address, a dress that was more faithful to what she was coming to know. She said, if I were to give that commencement address today, the main point would not be change the world, but rather let the world change you. Because that's what happened to her. She was taught that people were like these straw figures that you needed to defeat and convert. But what she discovered was they weren't straw figures at all. They were real, living, breathing human beings with a soul. The 34-year-old Evans wrote, I thought I was called to challenge the atheists, but the atheists ended up challenging me. I thought God wanted to use me to show gay people how to be straight. Instead, God used gay people to teach me how to be Christian. I thought the world needed my answers, but as it turns out, I needed the world's questions. As we see today, even the first apostles were changed by the world and the people in that world, in our world. You see, the Apostle Paul used to believe that God was calling him to go and kill the early followers of Jesus, of the followers of the way of Jesus. He believed God was calling him to snuff out this movement of people, of Jews, until he realized that God was actually calling him to be a leader and to help build up what these people were committed to. And the Apostle Peter used to believe the gospel was only for Jewish people and not for the Gentiles. Until Peter visited Antioch, the diverse community that Paul was serving, Paul who had come to believe passionately that the gospel was not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. And while Peter is in the midst of this diverse community, he has this really strange dream as told in Acts where he sees something like a white sheet coming down with four-footed creatures and snakes of the earth and birds of the air. And what's even more remarkable is Peter hears a voice saying, get up and eat, which raises a moral dilemma for Peter. For a good observant Jew, as Peter was, knows that the law forbids him for eating anything unclean, unkosher. So in faithfulness to what the scripture and tradition has taught him, Peter questions the invitation to eat this unkosher meal, but the heavenly voice is persistent. What God has made clean, you must not make profane. And not only does the voice say it once, but three times, which is code for this is really, really, really important. God wants Peter to get this. And so he listens and he has an experience of God which contradicts what he's been taught and come to believe. And then to confuse matters even more, while he's mulling all of this over, Peter is invited to go to Cornelius' home, a man who isn't just a Gentile but a Roman. And worse than that, a Roman officer in the very army that is oppressing the Jewish people and that has just recently killed Jesus, the one that Peter says is the Christ, the son of the living God. All of the alarm bells must be going off in Peter's mind and in his heart. Don't do this. But the spirit whispers, Cornelius is trustworthy. And he is 
We see in Acts that he's a good man, a man of prayer, a man who worships God, a man who helps the needy, and a man who's had his own strange encounter with God when he is visited by an angel who affirms his faithfulness and invites him to invite Peter into his home to cross this boundary between Jew and Roman, which he does. And so Peter comes into this home in what is the most consequential visit in early Christian history. And not only does Cornelius welcome Peter and greet him with reverence and respect, he welcomes him as if he's a messenger of the divine, which of course we know he is. And while in Cornelius' home, Peter speaks about what has been revealed to him in his dream, and he reminds Cornelius and the crowd that has gathered around him that this visit is forbidden by his tradition. And yet Peter is there anyway because of this persistent voice which has told him to no longer label anyone unclean. What a powerful sign that Peter is growing in his understanding of how radically inclusive the love of God is for God's people. Peter understands this is not about what food to eat and what not to eat. It's about crossing boundaries and extending the circle of God's love to people and leaders who were once his enemy. And Peter does that. In dramatic fashion. He not only crosses the boundary, he baptizes Cornelius and his entire household. And not only is Cornelius converted, I think Peter is re-converted to the gospel. And he is now aligned with Paul. And both Peter and Paul now believe that the gospel is for all people, Jew and Gentile. And they are now speaking in unison the words that Peter spoke today. It makes no difference who you are or where you are from. If you want God and are ready for what God has called you to do, the door is open. And Christianity is changed forever. Going forward, no person will ever be excluded or ought ever be excluded on the basis of race or any human devised distinction. For as Paul says today in Galatians, in Christ's family, there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female. Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are all in a common relationship with Jesus Christ. And from this point forward, it will be proclaimed as Peter does, God plays no favorites. But to be fair, it sure does seem like God has been playing favorites up until this moment. The Jews, after all, are the chosen people, right? And Jesus is the beloved son. And the church is a movement of these chosen people. It is a reformation of the Jewish tradition. So up until now, it sure does appear that God is playing favorites. But now, God has opened the door to a Roman soldier and to his family and the family of faith. Can you imagine Peter going back to the disciples and explaining all of this? Guess who's coming to dinner? And can you imagine the commencement address that Peter would give now and how different it would have been from the commencement address he would have given back then? Now, after all these things that have happened in Antioch with Cornelius and his family, now, after Peter allows the diverse world and God's radically inclusive love of that diversity to change him after he discovers that God is less concerned with creating boundaries and more concerned with breaking them down. Today we begin a four-week series on our first core value, or one of our core values, loving inclusively. We're going to explore loving inclusively. In November of 21, we adopted this statement that we believe that every human being, every human being is created in God's image. And as Christians, we're called to love God and God's creations, ourselves, our neighbors, the strangers, the marginalized, even our enemies. We value differences. 
We honor diversity. We recognize unique perspectives, talents, and experiences, and we learn from each other. Did you know there are two ways to herd cattle? You can build a fence. You can invest time and energy and resources, and you can put up miles upon miles of fencing, and you can invest even more time and energy and resources in maintaining those fences over the years. You can keep clear boundaries, and you can keep the herd within those boundaries. You can build fences, or you can build a well. You can build a well. You can invest time and energy and resources in digging deep and building a well, knowing that cattle are like every living creature. When they discover water somewhere, they will come back because we all need water to survive. And you know what? What's easier to maintain? Millions and miles of fences or some wells? Where, have been, where living water has been found. Think of all the time and energy and resources we've invested in boundary keeping as a church. I don't know about you, but I'm not interested in building fences. I don't think the church should be about fence building. I think we should be about digging some wells, redirecting our time, our energy, and our resources towards digging deep, knowing that when we dig deep and do what is right, we are building something not only for ourselves, but we're building something that every human soul truly needs and truly longs for. I don't think the world needs more fences. I think it needs more wells. And so this year we're going to dig wells together. We've got these four core values that are deeply Christian. And we should understand that and better understand that. And we're going to dive deep into each of these values over the course of this year. Loving inclusively, living contemplatively, sharing generously, acting justly. For every human soul not only needs these values, but will flourish as they commit themselves to it. And the work of loving inclusively is not simply the work of our time. It is the work of God for all time. For all time. And we see that not only as we look around our increasingly diverse world and begin to see the image of God in people we didn't imagine to see it, but we see it in our tradition and we see it in the scripture and in the arc of where it's all headed, which culminates in Jesus and his radically inclusive embrace of all people. Jesus is committed to extending the circle wider and wider. And we as followers of Jesus are called to that same work, the work of God for this time and for all time. Sometimes it takes someone on the outside of those boundaries that we've created to better help us understand what being an insider really means. So let me turn to a Sufi mystic to help us understand our Jewish Savior. The poet Rumi says, come close, closer, even closer. How long will this hindrance last? If you are me and I am you, what is this separation between you and me? We are the light of God. We are God's mirror. So why do we struggle with ourselves and with one another? Come, release yourself from this ego. Live in harmony with everyone. Be friendly with everyone. If you are by yourself, you are only one drop, one speck. Whereas when you bond and unite with everyone, you are an ocean. Water in different cups becomes one when the cups are broken. And they run as one. So let's build a well. For the world of which we are all a part can be incredibly dark and sick. 
And there is evidence that we are losing our way and we need the gospel, the good news of God's love now more than ever. But let's also be clear, there is goodness everywhere and in everyone for those with eyes to see. So let's build a well and let's break some cups together. For these cups, which were created for good, even sacred reasons, cannot, will not contain the living water, which like the grace of God, dwells in the depths of human life, in real life, and flows freely to all who are thirsty. Amen.